How's it going, folks? Welcome to Found Flicks. On this ending explain, we're looking at When Evil Lurks. We're in a remote village. Two brothers find a demon-infected man just about to give birth to evil itself. They decide to get rid of the body, only to end up unintentionally spreading chaos and death to everything in their paths. This is one of my most hyped of the year, because we are finally getting a full-length follow-up from writer-director Damien Rugna, behind one of my absolute favorite horror movies in years, Terrified, not Terrifier. His latest does feel right in the direction wheelhouse and many aspects will feel familiar to viewers of his work. He really doesn't mind pushing the envelope and when evil lurks has several incredibly disturbing and graphic moments. Even kids and animals aren't safe with this madman at the helm. There's a lot of world building to the story as well and I do wish that it had been a little bit more developed. It feels like it tells us just bits of what the bigger picture is and never really connects the dots in many ways. It's also a bit confusing how the evil works here. It's just more complex than the norm but it also leaves a ton on to the viewer to figure out on their own. And well, that's why we're here. So let's check out When Evil Lurks, breaking down the story, what we learn about the evil, the important rules in dealing with it, and explaining the quite hopeless ending. We're thrown into the rural farmlands of Argentina, and a pair of brothers have their peaceful lives upended. There's several distant gunshots, and they assume it must be their neighbor Ruiz. They set out in the morning to investigate, making their way across the plains. They continue into a forest, and their dogs grunt at something up ahead. They bark to alert them that they have found a rotting body. In fact, it has been completely cut in half. They debate what could have done this, initially thinking it was a puma, but based on the cut, it must have been something sharper responsible. They find a suitcase with the man filled with ornate odd equipment. Jimmy has seen the device before, but isn't quite sure of its purpose. They consider it could have been a thief that Ruiz dispatched, but when flipping through a journal, it appears that he was specifically headed towards another lady Maria's house. As soon as they arrive there, they are confused by the dogs whining their heads off, wondering why that is. They show Maria the papers, informing her that the man is not going to be making his appointment. She reveals that the man was coming here to deal with her son, Uriel. The so-called cleaner was on his way to kill the boy, and Uriel is definitely in a bad state, the stench and sight overwhelming the brothers as soon as they enter the house. We see that Uriel is bedridden, appearing bloated to an extreme degree and covered in strange gross. Yeah, not looking so hot. Here we start learning a bit more about the world here, as the boy chimes in that he's possessed. His mama blames herself for his state. She hoped that praying would do the trick. And Pedro growls, there are no more churches anymore. Hmm, wonder why that is. So there must have been some kind of spread of this infection of evil that somehow ties into the churches. The family's biggest fear is getting kicked off their land as they have nothing else. They hope to be able to take care of him, but now just need him dead. They did report Uriel to the police a year ago, but they have obviously been quite slow to respond. The brothers head right to the police station themselves to confront them, but they don't even believe them as they haven't seen a rotten before, and according to them, they never even got the report about Uriel in the first place. As for what to do now, there's strict protocol to call the public health department, and the rest is up to them. They meet with Ruiz, and the situation is desperate. He believes that the whole area would be marked and become a ghost town if they don't intervene. They consider leaving until another cleaner makes it out, but with Uriel on his deathbed, there is no time to wait. Ruiz has already noticed some telltale signs of the evil spreading, as his dog left months ago. All four of them. First, it makes the animals go crazy, and even makes the deceased go crazy, he says. They all agree they have to do something, and think they should just auction off everything before the rot goes viral. Ruiz counters that it could be a setup by the state. It's easy to just abandon them and cover it up. Essentially, they are on their own. Later at dinner with his wife, Ruiz can't take it anymore, quickly rising from his seat. Jimena shouts after to not do something stupid, but we already know he is. He rolls up to Maria's with a shotgun and kicks open the doors, ready to take care of business. Maria shrieks at him to not kill the boy, as that will only make the evil worse. It will spread and take their bodies and their souls. The cleaning must be done by a professional. Ruiz brings the gun right on Uriel, and he grumbles to kill me, you coward, before I move on to Jimena's belly and possess the life growing inside of her. Ultimately, Ruiz does not take the shot, breaking down in his truck. Jimena and the brothers show up later, and Ruiz cries that Uriel has been playing with and taunting them. They are relieved to see he's still alive, and the bros think it is time for them to jet. Ruiz argues that Uriel is the one that needs to leave and wants to cart him at least three hours away from their farms. The brothers think it's too risky and Ruiz calls them cowards. This is their land too. And Pedro has a family right? Well, do it for them. Thusly, they work together to maneuver the man with his sheets and with some great effort get him outside. They load him into the back of the truck and proceed to drive a suitable distance away. The brothers are still uncertain if this is the right thing to do and decide to keep going at least another hundred kilometers. Ruiz declares that this is the right thing to do 
and distracted from the road, he nearly runs right into a kid, swerving out of the way just in time. They drive out a bit further and find a good place to dump Uriel, but uh-oh, he fell out. Must have happened when they encountered that kid. Oh well, Ruiz says it's over and no longer their problem. He drops the brothers off later, and that's that, I guess. Well, obviously not. They just made a big problem into an even bigger one. In the morning, we see for ourselves how quickly the evil can spread with deadly consequences. Jimena calls out for her husband, pointing out one particular goat amongst the group, feeling it has been possessed. Ruiz retrieves a gun and fires it into the air, causing the animals to scatter, all except for that one. He aims at the animal, and Jimena goes for an axe, as it's important not to use a firearm to kill the evil. That, too, will condemn them. They have a lot of rules to keep track of here. Undeterred, he tells her to back up, and the goat casually walks right up to him, placing the barrel right at its head, almost taunting him to take the shot. He does so, and as soon as the animal goes down, Jimena becomes possessed and takes the axe right to the side of her husband's head. And inevitably, she doesn't last much longer either. Well, I'll tell you, that evil sure does spread quickly, and those hinted at rules seem pretty daggum important too. Don't break the rules, people. Later, the brothers are informed of what happened when Maria's son shows up, also learning that Maria has straight up disappeared. He's not sure what happened to her, but really feels that they did something bad by taking his brother. The kid doesn't want to be alone, and they relent to let him stay in the barn for one night only, also taking his firearm. He tells them of another rule, don't use electric light, as the shadows they cast draw the evil towards you. We actually just saw this in action moments ago. Jimmy was staring at a pair of antlers on the wall, and the shadows suddenly started stretching right before the boy showed up. Maybe he's evil too. The brother's plan is to head into town and pick up Pedro's family before heading out for good. Jimmy drops him off, and it's quickly clear that Pedro is not exactly welcome here. His ex has moved on to Leo, who straight up refuses to let him in. Pedro growls to let him into his house and shoves him out of the way. He asks for two sets of fresh clothes for him and Jimmy, and proceeds to strip down naked just as Sabrina enters. She's shocked by what he's doing, telling him to get out of here immediately. Also seeing the dog takes a pretty big whiff of his evil infested threads. He gets some fresh duds and proceeds to burn his old ones out in the street to the other's confusion, also pointing out that he's violating his restraining order. Uh oh, something bad definitely happened there. His boy Santino runs out, excited to see his papa, and Pedro uses him to sneak back inside. She tells him once more to leave, and he actually wants all of them to come along. He spills that a rotten was found, and things will quickly turn to hell. Well, might be too late for that already. Leo decides to call the police, and Sabrina puts her foot down. I make the decisions around here. He tries to get through to her about the rotten, but she flat out doesn't believe him, and accuses him of just showing up to scare the kids. He just can't stand seeing her happy. You disappear for four years and not send a single dollar, only to show up out of nowhere acting like a crazy fool. She gets emotional, yelling for him to get a new life, loser. We don't want you here. With the fracas distracting everyone, they don't notice as out of nowhere, the pup turns violent on Vicky, launching right at her face and probably the most surprising moment of the movie. You're like, whoa, damn, I didn't see that coming. That was shocking. Santino is a lone witness and bends down under the table, seeing Roger straight up ragdolling his sister. He yells to the adults to listen, and Leo comes to take a look. Roger drags her body out, and Leo screams to get him as Vicky is taken outside. Leo, along with Pedro, chase after, trying to rescue the girl. Pedro soon loses his breath and heads back to the house. He turns his attention to his other autistic son, Jair, attempting to rouse him from bed and get him focused. He rushes back downstairs, telling the others they are leaving. Leo is freaking, getting a gun loaded up. Pedro warns him not to use it on the dog. It's no longer a dog, but a demon. Leo peels out, and Pedro warns him again not to use the gun. So you think he's gonna use it? Yeah, of course. He encounters Gutierrez, who gives him more shit as usual, assuming he must have made another mistake. He warns them about using firearms as well, but it sounds to be pointless hearing a nearby gunshot. And yep, Leo has already taken out Roger, meaning the evil will continue to spread. Man, nobody listens to the rules in this thing. I was thinking that the actual initial spread of the rotten must have happened a long time ago, like decades. For the most part, it is now under control, or at least that's the story told to the public. That would help us understand why no one, for the most part, has actually seen a rotten before, or even knows how to properly deal with the evil. It's just been that long since it's been a big day-to-day -day problem. Pedro sprints back, strangely finding that Vicky is okay without even a scratch on her. That's weird. Santino is excited that his sis is back, but Pedro knows better. He works with Jair to find his mom's car keys, which only works when he promises the boy some of his favorite apple ice cream. Vicky is definitely still possessed, whispering to her mom, dad is going to come and kill you. He's going to come home in the car and boom, she demonstrates. Sabrina still doesn't get it, just happy to have her daughter back, taking her in her arms. Just as Pedro pulls out of the garage, Leo speeds up and does indeed ram right into the both of them. Vicky seems quite pleased with her prophecy coming true, jumping in excitement and 
still not injured in any way whatsoever. How the heck are you supposed to kill these things anyway? It's also kind of strange as we don't get any follow up on what happens to Vicky afterwards. Just dead, I guess, but still possessed. Or Leo, I mean, I don't know. There's one final stop on their so far disturbing family reunion as they go to pick up their mother without telling her initially what's going on. She starts trying to piece things together. As they have Sabrina's car, the two of them must be getting along, right? Oh yeah, totally, it's been going, going great. They do reveal about seeing the rotten and she too doesn't believe that they actually did, thinking they saw something that scared them and somehow were manipulated. Jimmy is curious if she's ever seen a possessed one. No, she fires back, well, outside of you two, clowns. However, she is much more familiar with the possessed, strengthening that idea that the initial outbreak occurred many years ago. There's even a song about it. They get in your body, infect your mind, take the most valuable thing in your life. Your body is no longer your body. Well, that's pretty catchy. Santino is frightened by the lyrics, but she assures him all you have to do is follow seven important rules so they can't get in your head and cause you to do things you don't want to. Don't use electric lights. Don't stay close to animals. Don't take anything close to them. Don't hurt them. Also, very importantly, never name evil by its name. Evil has a name, they ask? Oh, sure, Lucifer, Azrael, and she rattles off several different names for Satan. They interject, uh, isn't she doing that right now and also thusly breaking one of the rules? Again, not even the lady that knows the rules follows the rules, but of course she doesn't believe them either. She recalls a sixth rule, don't shoot them with firearms, but as for the last one, she can't remember. They stop off to get Jair some ice cream, but unfortunately they don't have any apple flavor. He starts growing louder and Santino whines that he wants to go home. Mom suggests they just go back to town, but Pedro reminds her that is no longer an option. Sabrina calls grandma and she hands the phones to Santino, telling him to say hi to his mom. Pedro knows it's no longer her and takes the call outside on his own. She sees, you took my children, I want them back. He tells her that the kids are fine and she rebuttals that they don't love you and don't want to live with you. Just as grandma mentioned, they go for what you love and Sabrina really digs a knife in here. She rants that he never gets it and that's why I cheated on you and fucked everyone. You are nothing, she continues, a little man. You gave me a broken child and wanted to get rid of him. I obviously Jair. She deems him a murderer and eerily says she knows where they are and she's coming back to get them. Whoa. He stomps the phone to bits and tosses it in the road and breaks down. He explains to Jimmy that he did see her die and that definitely wasn't her. He feels quite guilty about going over to the house. He took the evil right to her. He realizes now that he should have just left as soon as they had known and never come to town in the first place. Well, it's kind of true. Jimmy gives him a pep talk saying that he's proud of him. Plus the kids are watching and we don't want them scared. Pedro is still shaking, mumbling he didn't see what he did. Jimmy offers some fresh hope of someone that he knows that can potentially help. She lived through something similar and can lend them some cash as well. He takes him to meet Myrta, who has no power but plenty of room for everyone. Pedro declines as they are on their way to the city, but Jimmy considers that maybe it's not any better in the city. They could just hang out here for a while. Pedro tells her that they will definitely pay her the money back because they are good people. Yet there's an issue with the money, as it's in the bank and they're not open till Monday. With the news that Jair needs changing, it looks like Pedro has no choice but to lay low here for at least a few days. Myrta immediately feels that Jair is rotten. Jimmy explains that he's autistic, he's always like that, but she was already aware of that. She has been around some possessed in her life, even saying that she got used to living around them. So why come here, she wants to know, and Jimmy divulges that they think they saw one themselves. She knows better, if you saw rotten, there would be no question about it. Jimmy starts having some seeds of doubt of his own, thinking that it could just be his brother's imagination, or maybe something real that he just can't understand. I'm sure he'd feel a little bit differently if he had been at Sabrina's with his bro. She's all the same bro that plugged up the heater outtake, making it sound like he tried to blow up his family or something, that would certainly warrant a divorce, and Sabrina's angry demeanor towards him. Although Jimmy says that's not what really happened, just a rumor spread by bored people in a small town. Later, the brothers share a moment when Pedro inquires about Myrta and has figured out that they dated at some point. Jimmy sighs, that was a long time ago. I was younger, and she was too. He smirks, you were always a lovebird. Every year he'd come home from school crying that he missed his teachers. Well, now he knows what he really meant by that. He then grabs him by the scruff and tells him he loves him. He hunkers down in the car and tries to calm his son's nerves to no success. He grabs a drawing of the boys featuring a group of people in front of a red sun. Everyone else tries to get some sleep and things are calm for the moment, perhaps a bit too calm. Jair is still unable to sleep and a figure approaches the car, placing a 
bloody handprint on the window. And by some kind of innate ability, Myrda can already sense that something is off. Mama wakes up to Sabrina in the room, clutching the sleeping Santino. Mom excuses that she's a bit drugged from her sleep medication, and Sabrina tells her that she's here for the children. She turns, and we see that her face is all messed up. Jimmy rouses Pedro, and their mom details what happened. It was Sabrina, but it wasn't. Something is in there with his son. He stomps upstairs and flings open the door. Sabrina repeats that she's here for the children. They need me. Santino opens his eyes, seeing his daddy, and Sabrina leaps off the balcony. Pedro springs into action after him, shouting for his son. But don't forget Jair, whose entire side of the car is now covered in blood. He pounds on the windows, but can't get inside. So he smashes one, comforting him that daddy is here. Murda is still suspicious of him, not as autism, but thinks he truly is possessed with the evil. She's seen this before in an autistic person, pointing out his curled fingers. The demon has definitely got him. It attempts to fight for control of their mind, but they are unable to. So they end up in a kind of limbo of sorts that can last some time before the knot is untied. Pedro screams that he wants to get it. It must be near. She points out that is true. It's here, it's everywhere, and attached to both of them, scolding them for having no idea what they're dealing with. She opens up a fancy kit, just like the cleaners from the beginning, implying she must have been one herself. She says there are certain people who are unable to be directly controlled by the evil, but they can still be manipulated, as in getting information. She knows the important seventh rule, don't be afraid of dying. It's actually because of Pedro's own fear of Sabrina taking the kids that actually caused her to come here. That's why he can't go get his kid, hoping that he understands why. The fear of losing them helps the demon, as the evil knows more about your fears than even yourself. Jimmy offers to go in his stead, while Myrta and Pedro need to deal with the original rotten, Uriel, in order to stop the spread. They must kill the man to prevent the beast from being born. It's currently in what's called the birth process. For now, it's just its essence that has been freed. It's not physically born yet, so they have to kill it as soon as possible. Pedro admits he knows exactly where it is, quite far away from town, because, well, they took him there themselves. She chides them once more for removing a possessed, calling them idiots. Also kind of true, this is really all pretty much their fault. They head out on their respective missions, and Myrta fills us in about her past, as well as her initial encounter with a rotten. Back in the day, her and her husband ran a church, but they were frauds. She saw her first infected at their church, initially thinking it was just a hired actor, until he puked up all over them, and then puked up the remnants of his family that he had eaten the previous night. It was soon declared that God is dead, and the times of churches quickly ended. Then the cobras appeared, monks that taught them the way of killing the infected before they were physically born, which they did for 23 years, and she appreciates now how much damage they had actually done to the faith. Ambushes of the cleaners became more common, so it was no surprise that Maria's cleaner was taken out. One night, her husband didn't return from a clean, so she wisely left town. She says you only get one chance to escape evil, you can only escape everything once, running away to a place she didn't know existed. Which is what the brother should have done in the first place, obviously. She does have some concern that perhaps after all that time, the evil has finally tracked her down. Pedro doesn't get it. Then why take his kid instead of her? Well, because as she pointed out earlier, he is the one that's afraid, not her. Jimmy comes to Sabrina, hobbling down the road, blood and gore dripping onto the street. He pulls up slowly next to her, seeing the absolutely obliterated remnants of the boy. He drives past for a moment and comes to a stop, waiting for her to catch up. She yanks out some more of Santino's brain matter and chops down, traipsing past. Jimmy psychs himself up and crashes right into her and into a tree. That didn't work before. Pedro and Myrta reach the dumping spot, saying they'll have to continue on foot. Myrta knows better, spotting a sign for a nearby school. He must be there, as evil likes children, and children like evil. Jimmy comes to after the crash, and Sabrina rides upside down to face him. Jimmy, she groans, you told me you love me. I don't think she's lying here, and if that phone call earlier is any indication, Sabrina wasn't exactly a saint herself. Meanwhile, at Merida's, Jair surprisingly emerges from the car a completely changed person, speaking eloquently and moving without any difficulty. Looks like that demon finally got its way out of the knot of the boy's mind. Pedro and Mirta make it to the school, and she knows that it's not too late. When evil eats, Nature stops completely, while the birds and crickets are still chirping here. He has his flashlight, and she reminds him to shut it off. No more electric stuff going forward. They traverse around the school grounds, and Pedro comes to a room with several docile kids, all creepily staring forward. They find an unlocked door and burst inside. In one room, they pass a drawing quite similar to Jair's, with a red sun and everybody looking happy underneath. She enters the classroom with the kids, surveying them intently. She asks where it is, and one girl shakes her head no. She relays that they're here to help, and another girl shushes her with blood, 
blood dribbling from her mouth. She runs out of the room, choking and heaving moments later, reuniting with a baffled Pedro. What happened in there? She could smell the evil stench on the breaths of the children, and knows now they won't help them. They could even be hiding Uriel. She's never seen something like this, and is finally shaken, unsure if she can deal with all of them together. Another boy rolls up on his bike. As Myrta notes, children are compelled to come here to help the rotten, the evil kind of luring them here to assist it. They ask the kid if he's seen an injured person lately, and he keeps pedaling inside without a response. Pedro wants to make him talk no matter what, while Myrta urges caution. She doesn't want any more mistakes with lives at stake. She stresses that he needs to think before acting, and they need to make sure to keep an eye out for each other. How long until he blows that? Two seconds. The kid runs back outside and asks if they're looking for Uriel. Oh, he's at a house nearby with a traffic circle. Myrta invites him to come along with him, but he refuses, scampering back inside. Pedro is ready to roll, but Myrta suggests it could be a trap. The other girl from class appears, saying Uriel is actually at her house. Pedro is out enough of the game, smacking the girl with his car door, demanding to know where Santino is. The girl doesn't offer any help, but at least Myrta knows for sure now that it must be here. If they're trying to send them away, it must be because he is here. They return inside and head right for the stage. Pedro spots a hammer, considering Uriel is hidden underneath it. He pulls back the curtain and dogs appear barking at the window, further indicating they're on the right track. He cracks off a floorboard, finding a dead man, Myrna realizing it must be the parents. The kids did this? Pedro asks in shock, but as we all know, those aren't kids anymore. She orders him to grab her stuff from the truck, but don't run. Walk slowly. Pedro power walks past the children and collects all of her stuff. She peers down into the hole, grumbling, I found you, motherfucker. The same girl continues running interference, claiming that he wants to kill you. You gotta get out of here. Listen to me, please. I'm not trying to trick you. She gets to assembling her fancy evil murdering device while he continues removing the rest of the floor, revealing more and more bodies. Indeed, under the dog pile of bodies is Uriel, who is still alive, groaning to kill me now. Myrta tells him the only way to do so is using her device. They need to get him out of the hole so she can get the blade into his nape. Uriel digs once more at Pedro's insecurities, saying you wanted to take yourself out with your kids, you can do that to me. So I guess there was some truth to the whole plugging the fire thing. He definitely did something pretty bad. He spits to shut up, you fucker, knowing the evil is getting to him. The girl attempts to distract him with an ax in the office nearby. Do it for Santino. Don't let him die, she yells, and Pedro foolishly follows her words. Mirta warns him of the obvious trap, but it's too late. A kid binds up the door handles, and Mirta is taken out by those pesky children. The same girl takes the hammer repeatedly to her head with no feeling whatsoever. Pedro crashes the glass with a chair and undoes the lock. He rushes out to a blood trail left for Myrta and knows she's gone. Man, this guy really doesn't get it, huh? Just consistently makes the worst possible choices. I think that's kind of the whole point, though. If he got over this shit, none of it would have happened. To really hammer that idea home, Pedro takes a piece from that cleaner device and proceeds to beat Uriel's head to bloody bits, just like destroys it. He's all, I used a part of the machine, that counts right. Uh, no, you blew it extra big this time. As soon as Uriel is gone, the beast is born. A child covered in blood emerging from the stage. The kids open up the doors to the morning light as he takes his first steps. He pauses by Pedro and gives him a smile, marking his forehead with his bloody fingers. He blinks in the morning light and a dog comes up to hungrily lick his sticky fingers. The boy continues on and the kids follow after into a field. Wow, way to bring about the return of the beast, Pedro. Nice going, bud. He makes his way back to Miritas, finding a distraught Jamie waiting for him. He only gives him a hug and Pedro already knows the evil must have taken their mother too. He comes face to face with his boy, understanding that he must have killed her, and gives him that apple ice cream he's been after the whole time, seemingly reverting back to his regular state. Pedro scrubs all the blood off himself in the shower, but afterwards see the boy's bloody fingerprints remain, as though he's been permanently marked for his many mistakes. Jamie enters the barn, discovering Maria's kid still there. He ties up another loose end regarding the initial cleaner's killing. It was actually him behind it, as a voice in his head told him to do it. He cut his body into pieces and fed it to the pigs, and and he also ate from the body. What about his mom? Well, she suffered the same fate as their own mother. We see exactly what he means when Jair starts choking on a spoon. Pedro packs his bag, telling him to breathe. He reaches into his mouth, hitting a spot that spits blood. He keeps digging, and Jair hacks up a spool of hair, no doubt his mom's. He keeps yanking, pulling out more and more hair, until pulling out his mother's necklace depicting the family. Well, that sucks. This revelation completely breaks Pedro, who steps outside and unleashes a primal screech, pretty much 
what's the worst possible outcome imaginable? There's really no moving on from all the death and destruction they've been through. And man, that Pedro. Talk about being your own worst enemy, huh? This dude just constantly bungles things every step of the way. They even specifically make it clear at every one of those crucial decision moments what is the right thing to do. And he without fail does not adhere to this. This is a life or death situation he's in. And it's understandable that he wants to save his family no matter the cost. That makes sense, of course. For him, it's kind of like, sure, he doesn't listen, but thinks he's doing the right thing. Whatever it takes, you know, only to afterwards regret is clearly a poor choice. If only he thought before acting, that seems to be his biggest issue. And it's this that gets him dragged deeper and deeper into the darkness, to the point of losing pretty much his entire extended family by the end. Sure, he still has Jair, but knowing that he ate his mother probably sours the relationship a little bit. Hard to come back Back from that, I guess. Amongst his many blunders, the one with the biggest impact, no doubt, is that he didn't follow the rules when killing Uriel. I mean, he knew exactly how to kill him and still didn't do it properly. He let the evil get to him again and might have, in fact, doomed the entirety of humanity. We don't know exactly what the beast being born means, but assuming it's kind of a rebirth of Satan, Antichrist kind of thing, he could have single-handedly brought forth the end of the world. Way to go, Pedro. Lesson is, think before you act, particularly when it comes to evil with uh, especially complicated rules. With that, we've reached the conclusion of this thing explained for when evil lurks. But don't forget, before we go, you can send me requests for any movies or TV shows you'd like to see me explain by sending them my way on any of my social media accounts at Foundflix. What did you think of when evil lurks and its ending? What do you think it all means? Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. Make sure to like, subscribe, and follow. Thanks for watching Foundflix. See you next time.